Good morning. Let's all stand and we're going to ask Daryl to open us up in prayer. Lord, thank you again this morning, Lord, for giving us all the help and ability, Lord, to come out this morning every day. Lord, I want to thank you this morning for a church, Lord, still teaching your word. Lord, I just pray this morning everyone opens their hearts and minds, Lord. Let this message sink in, Lord, and realize that if they don't have you, Lord, they don't have anything, Lord. Lord, I want to thank you for all the love, mercy, and grace that you show us each and every day, Lord. We don't deserve it, but you still give it to us. I want to thank you for that. Lord, I want to pray for our men and women of the military, Lord. Pray for our missionaries that are on the battlefield, Lord. I pray that you continue to give them fruit for their labor, Lord, and maybe do their part to get them as much as we can, Lord. Lord, I want to thank you for the teacher that we had across the way, Lord. Teaching these little ones, Lord, I just pray that we have him also, Lord. I want to thank you for this, Lord. I pray for all of our sick folks, everyone on the prayer list, the unspoken list, Lord. I just pray that you help us all. God direct us in all of your decisions, Lord. Lord, I just want to thank you again for dying on that cross for nobody like me, Lord. Thank you for sharing that precious blood. Lord, I want to thank you for the one that came uh, up here the other day, Lord. I hey, want to bless hey. you, Lord. I know that Patty is even super happy, Lord. I just want to thank you again for all that you do for us. Love us. Please forgive us for each other, Lord. We ask you to thank your precious name. Always pray that you will be done all day. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being seated. Good to see everybody this morning here at Emmanuel Baptist Church. And yes, as Daryl just said, praise God. We had one come down here and at the altar, and the altar's open. Uh, open today as well, so we pray uh, for, for good things there. We'll have Sherry play us a, a song and we'll kind of continue around like we have here. here and uh, very current and of course it talks about the, uh, the big storms and the uh, electricity outages and all that of course we have some members uh, that dealt with a lot of this as well it starts out by quoting Psalm verse 20 or excuse me Psalm 27 verse 13 and 14 and you know it it says I had fainted or losing my heart unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Then he goes in. He says, During this frigid weather in the United States, millions have been dealing with the electricity blackouts throughout Texas. Several million are still without electricity. And for the first time, there are some teens in Texas that are learning to live without electricity and, can you even imagine it, a cell phone. For the first time in their lives, they're enjoying uh, the privilege of experiencing what life was like decades ago, forced to slow down, unable to text or to use social media. Everyone who lost power entered a moment of technological communication silence 
and they waited anxiously for the powers that be to restore their normal life patterns. How many actually enjoyed this, he asked, or found some kind of relief from the tyranny of communication technology, I wonder. Uh, how many actually took any time out to wait on the Lord? He says, I have to wonder if the Almighty had much more company than he was used to during this time, and he certainly hoped so. So the above uh, 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 passage there in Psalm, Psalm uh, 27 speaks of a fainted heart or losing your heart except for the expectation of faith in the goodness of God. How long could you go without electrical power before you might begin to lose heart? At what point would waiting on the Lord become your only source of hope or encouragement? How much really do we depend on earthly power? And how much power, or excuse me, and, and how much power on uh, how much on the power of God? Webster's definition of wait is to stay or rest in. It's a quiet place of abiding, and this kind of waiting is expectant because in it you are awakening your conscious relationship with God in this, and you have every reason to expect His love, His comfort, His restorative power to flow from your communion, your relationship with Him. But for many of us, it's hard to enter silence, isn't it? So when the power goes off, we kind of fidget until it's restored. Is our weak heart our, and our earthly strength just about dried up? The Word says, be of good courage and wait on the Lord. There's power and courage to be received simply by waiting on Him. Many a Christian has experienced it countless times and can tell you confidently that God will renew your strength. He will encourage and prepare you for whatever comes next. So, we have to wait on the Lord sometimes. Amen. Amen. comes and gets situated let's go through the prayer list as we continue to pray for our missionaries Daryl prayed for them earlier just pray for them all of them in so many different situations and then you know prayers continue to pray for the unspoken prayer request and I had someone tell, tell me they had a specific unspoken prayer request especially this morning pray for Mrs. Vice and Mrs. Walker and Mrs. Kimbrell keep praying for Charlie Roberts and Keep praying for Marcy and for Jeannie and Jason and Rick all there in Missouri. Keep praying for Jeff Bonds and for Don Hayes. And then Will's got a friend that was in a, uh, an accident at work, Colby Harmon, uh, that certainly needs our prayers. And just remember all those that are sick and that have lost loved ones here recently. Just lift everyone up to your prayers. Amen. Amen.
Fine, that's fine. Goodness gracious, that's good. I needed that. I needed that. What Chad said while we go, I, I need uh, that very much. Good crowd this morning, uh, despite the ice. Isn't that something else? Uh, Greg come out here to clean the parking lot off, and he said he couldn't hardly do it because of the ice and things. And I appreciate you people battling the weather uh, to come. Somebody said it's going to rain. It's going to warm up. We'll take that. I'm ready for spring. Turn with me to Revelation in chapter 1 for just a moment. Revelation in chapter 1. <clears throat> Somebody said this years ago, the clock of God, of God, the clock of God is wound but once. No man has the power to tell when the clock will stop or whether it will be late or early. John is put on the island of Patmos. All of you know this. And in verse 1, you're going to notice in the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. The word shortly means quickly. It means now. Shortly come, soon uh, in this. And then we know that during this time, John is on the island. The Lord is going to reveal so many things to John. And we're going to find the seven <coughs> churches of Asia Minor in chapter 2 and chapter 3. We see the rapture in chapter 4. We see the tribulation on and on and on in this. And then we come to the last chapter, which is chapter 22. In verse 7, you're going to see Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. In verse 12, you see the same thing. Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. In verse 22 of the same chapter, you notice that Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. And then the next verse, John said, even so come Lord Jesus. <laughs> John said, I'm ready. I'm ready too. I'm ready for Him to come. I truly, truly am. The word quickly is an interesting word that Jesus used in, uh, uh, in Revelation in chapter 22. And a very interesting word. We're going to take this word and break it down and look at it at two different ways in, in this here. The first thing, uh, I'm going to look at the time of His coming. The time of His coming. Then the second, I'm going to look at the manner of His coming in this here. So I look and I think about the time of His coming. What Chaz read to you there a while ago, we wait. We look and we'll say, it looks like the time is now. We can go to 2 Timothy in chapter 3 and we can see in the last days perilous times shall come. Men will do this and they'll do that. And then we find that, that Paul writes about 18 different things about how people are going to act and so on. But in writing in 1 Thessalonians, and turn there with me for just a moment, in 1 Thessalonians, the people in 1 Thessalonians are going through uh, very difficult times uh, in this here. And uh, Paul is going to write five chapters. At the end of every chapter, Paul is going to make this remark or similar to that, wait. He's coming, He's coming, but wait. Alright? Now, uh, you and I, when we go through trying times, and uh, a lady that uh, Judy uh, uh, loved very much used to say whenever they'd go through difficult times, she'd say, come on, Lord, come on. Uh, 
he uh, she's died she went home and Jesus still hasn't come but we want that sometimes we'll say come Lord all right now in in the persecution that the, that the people are going through in second in first Thessalonians look at chapter 1 and look at verse 10 and to wait for his son from heaven okay chapter 2 <clears throat> look at verse 19 he said, For what is your hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? Alright, look at chapter 3. And look at verse 13. To the end He may establish your heart unblameable uh, in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. Then in chapter 4, you can begin in verse 13 and go to the end of that chapter. That's talking about the rapture. And we wait. Uh, a thing that always amazed me about Paul whenever he gets over in this part here. Uh, Paul writes like, I'm going to, we're going to be raptured in my time. The Lord's going to come in my time. But he never, he never did. But we come to chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians and look at verse 23. And the very God of our, of our peace sanctify you holy, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be present blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying this, I know what you're going through. I sympathize with you in this here, but hang in there. Hang in there and wait and wait uh, in this here. We are creatures of time. Uh, sometimes we forget about what Peter told us in uh, in Second Peter and chapter uh, three. If I can get there for just a second, listen to uh, listen to what Peter says in chapter three. He said, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And he said, And a thousand years as one day. So God doesn't look at time like you and I look at time. And one of the reasons is He created time in this here. And so I think about we're creatures of time in this here. Uh, we look at animals and we'll find an animal hibernates. Who tells that animal, animal to do that? We find animals will put on fur. We find they take it off. We find trees up and they, they bud and then they, they, the leaves fall off and this and that. We're creatures of time uh, in in this here, and we look and we think about it, and I'm thinking very much about. I'm ready for spring to come. I've had enough of winter. I'm ready for spring, but it's going to come when God gets ready to send it in this here. And I get to thinking sometimes about uh, God as being a creature, uh, a creator of time and so on, and. Uh, my mind goes over to uh, Exodus in chapter 3 and go there with me for just a second. Exodus in chapter 3 and I was sitting in the study this morning and I was, uh, I was thinking uh, about this and uh, God looks down and God sees the nation of Israel in bondage. Many, many multitudes of people that are in bondage in Egypt. And God says, I'm going to bring them out of, out, out of Egypt. I'm going to bring them out of bondage. Let me ask you this. How would you, how would you bring a nation? Many people think there's at least two million. How would you bring a nation out of bondage. How would you do it? I don't know how I'd do it, but I don't know that I would do it like God did it in this here. 
God's going to use, He's going to use an 80 year old man. 80 years old. A lot of the times when we get to thinking at that age, and I know what some of you are thinking, we'll put him on the shelf. He's too old to do this or do that. 80 years old man, God is going to use. Not only is God going to use an 80 year old man, but God is going to use a shepherd. A man that has been a shepherd for 40 years. God's going to use him in this here. And we look at this and we'll say, he's not educated. He doesn't have, he doesn't have all of the attributes that other people have got, and yet God is going to use him. In chapter 3, God is going to call Moses. And finally, and whenever you come down to uh, verse 13, look at this here. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of our fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is thy name? Or what is his name? What shall I say unto them? Now look at that. What is his name? He said, Lord, what will I say? What will I say? What will I say? God says, you tell them this, Moses. I am that I am. You tell them that. In other words, I am the God of yesterday. I am the God of today. I am the God of tomorrow. I am the God of, of yesterday. I am the God of present and I'm the God of tomorrow in this here. That's how great God is in this here. And I look and I think about when is He coming? I don't know. But it could be any time in, in this here. And I think about God is the creator of this. Now if He's the creator of this, God is going to be able to do some tremendous things. Turn with me to Jeremiah or to Isaiah and look at chapter 46 of Isaiah. Now listen as we pick up in, in verse 8 of this here. We have a God that is omnipotent. We have a God that, as I said, it is per did you know that everything is present with God? Did you know that? Did you know the sun never sets with God? It never does. He's God. Alright, now watch what He says in this here. In verse 8 as we go down. Remember this, show yourself uh, and show yourself men. Bring it again to mind, O you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God. There is none else. I am God. There is none like me. Nobody like me. Alright? I'm a curious person. And I look at that and I think, nobody like God. That's what He said. He said, there's none like me. Well, I get to thinking about it. And now watch the next verse in this here. Declaring the end from the beginning. Everything is present with God. Declaring the end from the beginning. Nobody. Nobody can do that except God. God's only one that we can speculate. Paul writing to the, uh, to the people in 1 Thessalonians and he said, you know, he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. But Paul didn't know when he was coming. Paul was looking for him to come, but Paul didn't know in this year. But God does. God knows in this here. Now watch this again. Declaring the end from the beginning. From ancient times to the things that are yet that are not yet done. Saying my counsel shall stand and I shall will do all my pleasure. Calling a rabious bird, and that would be Cyrus, 
From the east a man that executeth my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass, I have purposed it, and I will also do it. God says, I am God. I'm God. In this and I look and I think, okay, okay, I'm God. And in this here and I think about what a what a tremendous thing. He's coming. He's coming. Um, Matthew tells us that man does not know. Uh, angels do not know. Only God knows when the Son of Man is coming. So what am I to do? I'm to wait and I'm to, to uh, uh, look at it in this here. And uh, let, me, uh, let me share something else with you. Let's go back to 2 Kings and chapter 20. 2 Kings and chapter 20. Most generally, whenever I talk about Hezekiah getting sick, I use the book of Isaiah, but we'll not do that uh, in this here. <laughs> and look here with me. I'll look at verse 1 and 2, and then we'll drop down a little bit in this here. 2 Kings uh, in chapter 20. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thy house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. How about that? Then he turned his face to the wall and he prayed unto the Lord. And you'll see what he had to say uh, in, in this here. And then in verse 6, you're going to find that the Lord is going to say, Okay, I'm going to give you 15 years. 15 years uh, in, in this here. And so let's, let's look at verse 8 and we'll go down a verse or two. Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, what shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me that I shall go into the house of the Lord the third day? And Isaiah said, This sign shall, shall this sign thou shalt have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten degrees or go back ten degrees? What a question. What a thought. Should, now look at that. Shall the shadow go forward 10? Or go back 10? In this here. And Hezekiah answered and said, Is it like thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees? Nay, but let the shadow return backwards 10 degrees in this here. It doesn't make sense any difference to God. Whether up or down in this here. He controls all of this thing here. We sometimes get to thinking about the people in Washington and they think they, they, they're getting worse and worse and worse all the time. And they'll continue to get that until they bring God back into America. They bring God back into our country in this here. And I think they they act like they're God. They are, act like they can control all of this. But listen, God is still on the throne. God's still running. He's still running His thing. And He looks and He said, what's the big deal? Upward or downward 10 degrees in this here? He is God in this here. He's the one that gave Hezekiah. He's the one that said, I'll add unto you 15 years in, in this here. So I get to thinking and I, I look and I ponder upon, upon this here, waiting, waiting for Him to come in this here. And I look and see uh, Jesus saying to John, Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. And John said, Even so, come Lord Jesus. 
Even so, come, Lord Jesus. I want you to come. I'm ready for you to come. The time in this now, to help us a little bit to understand that, of the time uh, of this here, the writer of Hebrews, and go with me to the to the book of Hebrews in this here, and uh, I'm not going. I, I'm I'm not going to tell you. Uh, uh, I'll not tell you who I think is the writer of this here, but uh, uh, <clears throat> I want you to notice as to what he's going to tell us in in Hebrews in chapter <clears throat> ten. And notice the very first part of verse 1. You can go back in your spare time and read and talks about the sacrifice, the sacrifice, the blood, and on and on in Hebrews. And then when he comes to chapter 10, listen to this. For the law having a shadow of good things to come. Alright? The law can't save anybody, and we know this in Exodus in chapter 20, but the law can show us some things, can direct us in this here, but the law, the law doesn't, the law wasn't written to, uh, uh, to uh, save anybody or anything uh, like this here. But the writer says, there's a shadow to come. Well, I look at this and I think about a shadow to come. A shadow to come. And I go back in Hebrews and I look at the calves uh, that, they, uh, that they slew and I look at this and I look at that as to what they did in this. A shadow to come. Now watch as he goes on. Not the very image of the things can never with these no sacrifice which they offered year by year continually make the comers unto Perfect, in other words, uh, complete in in this here. And I go back and I think, yeah, that's right. Uh, it, 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 it couldn't make them complete. It couldn't make them perfect in this here. But you say, you say, writer, that a shadow is to come. You've already figured it out. That shadow that is to come is Christ. And is what is he going to do? He's going to come. He's going to go to the cross. He's going to up and and give his life upon the cross for preach people like you and I in this here. And whenever we see that, he's going to up because of what he does upon the cross. He's going to give us eternal redemption. Something that we can't buy. Something that we can't work for. Eternal redemption. We can have that because of what He done upon the cross in this. And I look and I think all the things that's coming. The things that's coming in this here. And I look at the time and I say, okay, now what am I to do? I'm to wait. I'm to be like the people in 1 Thessalonians. I'm to wait. I'm to wait. I'm to wait uh, in this year. Then I look and I think about the time, any time, any time. Everything it looks like is ready. Everything it looks like is ready in this. But I look and I think about the manner of this time in this year. The manner of this time, he's not going to put up a billboard. He's not going to put up here and say, uh, in so and so day, at so and so hour, so and so many, he's going to come. He's not going to do that. He's going to come unannounced. He's going to come unexpectedly in this year. Maybe to show you one of the best examples that, that you and I can find uh, in this year. Let's go to Matthew in chapter 25. Matthew in chapter 25. Now remember, we're waiting for the we're waiting for the Lord to come in this year. Now the manner of his coming is going to be any time. 
any time, unexpectedly, unannounced in this here. Alright? Now, I'm thinking, and as I think about this, if the manner His coming is unannounced, if it is unexpected in this here, we see that He could come any time. Everything is laid out here. Uh, the next thing on God's calendar is the rapture of the church. That's the next thing. And I look and I think the manner of His coming in this, if He doesn't tell me when, if I'm smart, I'm going to be prepared for that coming. If I don't know when it's going to be, but I know it's going to come, but I don't know when, I need to prepare for that coming. And I think maybe one of the best illustration is looking at the bridegroom in chapter 25 of Matthew and the ten virgins. And I think they, they will give us a good, a good illustration of this here. And we'll use all, all maybe down to verse uh, 12 or verse 13 of this here. Then shall... That takes you back to chapter 24. We'll not get involved in that right now. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be like unto ten virgins. Now watch this. Which took their lamps, and their lamps is, uh, the lamps in, in this here is represents the brightness and the glory uh, of, of the Lord and things. And went forth to meet the bridegroom. Alright, now ten of them. Okay? And five were wise, five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, took no oil with them. Unexpected. Unprepared. Unprepared. The oil represents the Holy Spirit of God. And the, and, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Go you out to meet him. And all, of, all these virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of, our, of your all, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered and said, Not so, lest there be not enough for you and for us and you, but ye, go ye rather to them and sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, now, now stay with me in this, they're unprepared. They didn't prepare for this. Now, whenever they go back, now watch this. When they went to buy, the bridegroom came. They're unprepared. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. After came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day or the hour when the Son were in the Son of Man coming in this year. What an illustration of the manner of His coming. Unexpectedly, those, those five foolish ones, they, didn't, they weren't prepared for this. They never thought about it. They never. But you know something? Whenever He came, when the bridegroom come, they wanted it. And whenever he shut the door, the door was shut. And no man can open that door. You remember 
in Genesis in chapter 6? You remember whenever uh, God says, I'm going to destroy the I'm going to destroy the earth because of the wickedness and so on. And, and in chapter 6, when we come down to the end of that chapter, we find this here. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God said to Noah, Noah, I want you to up and build an ark. Now Noah had no idea what an ark was. It had never rained. What would you want an ark for? What would you want a boat for? It's never rained. But when you and I, when you and I prepare, when you and I look out and realize that he could come anytime in these here, you know what we do? We'll up and we'll do what God says. And God gave him the plan as to how to build that ark. And Noah and his family goes to work on that. They work on it. And they work on it for 120 years. Sawing. Hammering. getting, Putting the boards together. Pitching it. Doing it just exactly like God said to do it in this year. And then one day, God said, Noah, yes, bring your family in. And Noah got his family. I'll tell you right now, there's nothing like, there's nothing like a family that's all saved. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like that. Mercy, goodness, what a what a thing! Can you imagine? Can you imagine what a blessing that was to know when God says, "Noah, come on in." Noah got his three boys and their wives, and they came in. And after they got all the animals in and everything like that, the Bible said that God shut the door, and it began to rain, and it rained, and it rained. And it rained. Can you imagine the people that tried to get in that boat? That ark. But they couldn't. Why? They were unprepared. God had up and shut the door. And let me tell you people, when God shuts a door, it shuts. You can't get a crowbar and you can't open it up in this here. It's over with in this here. And so I look at this in chapter 25 of Matthew. And I, and I look at this and I think about, look at 11, 12, and 13. After it came also the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Yes, yes. And he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, Lord, uh, I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now, I got to thinking about that. And I thought, okay, Lord, you tell me that I'm to watch. Yeah, that's what I said. Now, uh, Lord, how am I going to watch? What am I going to do to watch in, in something like this here? I, I know the Bible tells me time and time again, and we've seen some of the things this morning. We've seen where the Bible said that He's coming. His coming is going to be swift. His coming is going to be shortly. His coming is going to be unannounced in this year. But how am I? How am I to watch? What am I to do? In, in in this here. Well, the thing that, that I, I have got to do in this here, I've got to be like the Apostle Paul. Not that I'm going to be a, an apostle or anything like that. But Paul, whenever he were writing to the churches, and you'll, you'll see this in 1 Thessalonians and, and other places, Paul was expecting the Lord to come Anytime. 
let me let me show you. Keep your finger here, at Matthew. But I'm going to come back here in just a minute. I want to show you uh, in uh, First Thessalonians in chapter four the rapture of the church. I want to show you uh, this here uh, in this here and starting in verse thirteen. And uh, I want to call your attention to some things here that Paul is going to say, the words he's going to use. Now look at verse thirteen. Now remember. This is going to be the next thing on God's calendar there is a rapture of the church. I don't know when it's going to be. I, I don't know. I, I'm as honest as I could be. Uh, but I look and I think, Lord, surely it's not going to be long. Surely it's not going to uh, be long in this here. Uh, to look at and see the wickedness and all of the things that's going on uh, in, in our world today. Uh, in this here. But now watch Paul. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you saw not even others which have no hope. For if we, you see that? We. Paul is including himself into with these people here. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so also which sleep in Jesus will, will God bring with Him. For this we say unto you how, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Paul was looking at this and Paul said, I believe He's going to come in my time. <laughs> I'm ready for this here. For if the Lord shall descend, for the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Oh, what a what a glorious time that will be uh, in this here. And he said, Then we see that? Which are alive and remain shall be caught up together unto them in the Lord to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord again. Paul looked at this and Paul wrote about the rapture and Paul is saying, you know what? I, 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 I could be raptured. But it didn't happen. Paul, if tradition is right, had his head cut off by Nero uh, in this year. Paul's home. Paul's been home for long time now in this here. So Paul uh, Paul thought the rapture would come in, in here, but it didn't. Now let's go back for just a moment and show you about how sudden how this thing is going to work in this here. Behold, I come quickly, Jesus said. That's what He told John. I come quickly. I come unexpectedly. I can come shortly. I, I, I'm coming in this here. Now in Ch Matthew chapter 24, notice with me in verse 36. But of the day and the hour knoweth no man. He's talking about the coming. Nor the angel of heaven, but my Father only. Okay? So uh, uh, no man has a right to predict. We can speculate. Any, any, any child of God that's got any biblical knowledge can look and say, you know what, I believe it could be any time. Yes, yes. It looks like everything is ready in this here. Alright, let me show you how it works. Look okay, here. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the man be. Alright? Now, I look at this and I say, Lord, how were the days of Noah? How were the days of Noah? Well, I could go back to I could go back to Genesis 17, Genesis 18, Genesis 19. I could go back and I could see something about the uh, the days of Noah. But Jesus said, "I'm going to tell you." All right, look you here. He said, "For as in the days they were before the flood, they were eating, they were eating." Uh, and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. 
Noah. Now, now I, I, I got ahead of myself there just a little bit. Uh, that, that would take you back to Genesis in chapter 6. Okay? And you go back there and you see the evil continued and so on uh, in, in this here. Alright, now watch the next. And they knew not until the flood came. Okay? They didn't know. They weren't prepared. They weren't living. Alright, now watch here. Uh, took them all away, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be uh, in, in this here. Isn't that something? Unprepared. Until 120 years, they got ready. Or they, they, had, they had an opportunity to get ready, but they didn't do it. Turn with me for just a moment. Keep your finger here. Go with me to Luke in chapter 17. Luke in chapter 17. Uh, and I'll, I'll get back where I was talking about a while ago about uh, Lot and, uh, and, so, and Noah and so on uh, like this here. Look at verse 28 of uh, Luke in chapter 17. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot they did eat. And it, now, now that would take you back to Genesis 16, 17, and 18. All right, now look here. And they were giving it, uh, they eat and they drank. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. Never do you find the people getting ready. When it, you remember, you remember what was it? Chapter 18 of Genesis, when God says, I, I'm looking at the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm looking at it. I'm going. I'm going to destroy the city. I'm going to destroy the city. You remember Abraham? Abraham came to the Lord. He said, "Lord, Lord, if if I could go down, uh, you'll see this in chapter 18. If I can go down and find." 50 righteous people. Will you spare Sodom and Gomorrah? 50 righteous people. God said, I will. Noah goes down. And he can't find them. And he comes back and he said, Lord, if I can find 40, will you spare the city? And God says, I will. He couldn't find 40. Finally, he keeps going back and forth and finally he said, Lord, if I can find 10, if I can find 10. He couldn't find 10 righteous people in that city. Billy Graham years and years ago said if America doesn't turn and come back to God, it's going to be worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. We are up and we're making things laws. Uh, we're, we're, we're up and we're, we're making laws for the criminal today, for the people that are doing wrong. We're making all kinds of laws for them and it makes it harder and harder and difficult for other people. I look at this and I think about when, Lord? Well, let's go back to Matthew 24 again. And you're going to notice in verse 40 as we go down in this here. There shall be two in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. In other words, unexpected. Here's a righteous one working in the field. Here's an unrighteous one working in the field. The righteous woman, the righteous one is going to be taken out of here. The other one is left. Do you realize what he's talking about here? He's talking about the rapture. He's talking about if you're not prepared, you're going to be left. And what's going to happen if we're going to be left, we have to go through 
the seven year tribulation. What a horrible, horrible time that will be. Now notice as it goes on. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, Jesus said. The one shall be taken, other left. Watch therefore, you know not what hour your Lord will come. He said, watch. I look at this and I say, I'm watching, Lord. But Lord, is there something more than just watching? And I think He could say, watch with expectation. Today could be the day. If it's not today, tomorrow could be the time. I, I look at this and I think with all my heart and soul, I think that we need to get down to business like we've never got down to business in this Christianity. This thing is real. It's real in, in this here. You that, uh, I shouldn't say you, we, that have got unsaved relatives, how we need to be praying for them. How we not only need to be praying for them, but we need to be living in a time of expectation. It could be today. It could be today. I say to you this morning, if you're not saved, I pray you'll come this morning like this one came last Sunday morning. That's the only way that we're going to prepare is that we get saved and we get saved and we, we wait with expe expectation that today He might come. Jesus loves you. He showed us how much He loved us because He went to the cross and He died up on the cross. I thought yesterday as I was in a home and I holding this man's hand as we were having prayer and I thought about I thought about that precious blood that Jesus shed on Calvary that day. That precious blood is the only thing that can wash our sins away. Not water, not water, not works, not this, not that, but that precious blood of Jesus Christ can wash away our sins. Will you come to Him this morning? Would you receive Him as your Savior? You over in the fellowship hall, all come today. Lord, I thank You for the time You give us this morning. I thank You for the people that brave the, the cold and brave the icy and the, and the snowy roads. I thank You for them today. And I pray that we could say when we go through these doors at the end, <coughs> that it was good to be in the house of the Lord. Lord, bless these people. Help them. Oh, Lord, those that are walking through troublesome times, lift them up like nobody can lift them up like you can. Meet every need these people have. Forgive us of our sins, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand in His... Sherry sings or plays a number to give you an opportunity to come this morning. Will you come this morning? fellowship hall, anybody? Jim, dismiss this in prayer. Lord God, help me, Father, we want to thank you for the blessings and the of this day. Lord, 
so many of us look at the things we don't have rather than the things that we do have. From the Pacific to the Atlantic, man is covered by earth with all kinds of hardships. In one swift day, the Lord covered it with a fluffy white blanket. He took all the open and sword. So Lord, we thank you for that blessing. If we can't look out there and see that blessing, I feel sorry for you. I just pray that each and every one of you humble enough to accept this bounty and this blessing and be scared of which it isn't. Lord, I pray that you will grant me the Spirit to help your people. Use me as a vessel with the words that you want them to hear. Lord, I just pray for all these parishioners, for Brother Latimer, for all our missionaries. Lord, I just pray that you will help the Christians through this quite much, like you helped the Israelites. It's almost scary sometimes when I have these thoughts. But this week I was thinking, two are in the field, one goes and one stays. Two are on the threshing floor, one stays and one goes. Will you be the one that goes or the one that stays? Lord, I want to apologize to all these folks for this lengthy prayer. But I will not apologize for its content. It's all that you blessed me. Amen.